What is going on everybody? Welcome back to Jelly Goon TV. Welcome back to all my beautiful viewers and subscribers. Welcome back to the gorgeous Jelly Goon Squad, of course. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the gorgeous Jelly Goon Squad. Today we have another video. We are going to react to a very special video because I heard in Russia there is no serial killers. No serial killers. There is not many. There is definitely not many in Russia. But we're going to react to the granny killer of Russia. The disturbing case of the Volka maniac Radik Tagilov. Ta Why do I pronounce it like that? Radik Tagilov. <laughs> Radik Tagilov. So that's what we're going to do. Hit him up on Google. Do what you have to do. I don't know if this propaganda, whatever you want to call it. I know there's some comments down below. We had no serial killers in Russia. Well, you're not perfect. Sorry. Anyway, without further ado, let's get into this. Let's see what's going on, man. So he's probably running around killing grannies and being a crazy guy because he never got love from his mom, from his mother or father. So, uh, yeah, definitely going to see what's going on. Let's go. Granny One kid. unsolved death in the vibrant city of Kazan would flare out to become the start of a long, grisly series of murders. Really? And although the hands of the vulgar maniac firmly gripped fear throughout Russia, it would take more than 10 years and the most really? unexpected twist of events to finally discover who the killer really was. 10 years? Wow. My name is Adrian, and welcome back to Coffee House Crime. He's now, a foreigner. Read the title, That's why. I'm here today to tell you about the case of the vulgar maniac. And despite him being Russia's most wanted criminal from 2012, all the way through to 2020, wow. this case is hardly spoken about in the Western mm. world. Not to be confused with my case. Not in, in the, not in the Western world only. I don't think Russians, they speak highly of this. Watch the comment down on this video right now. Uh, people, they're gonna spell like, it's a lie. He was a good guy. He was an amazing guy. You know, like that's just typical my comment section sometimes, but it is what it is. He was a serial killer. He killed for 10 years, not 10 years, but he, he didn't get caught for 10 years, I guess. I don't know, but that's kind of crazy, man. That's a long time to go and just kill grannies, man. Poor ass grannies. They did their things to society and now you're killing them? What the hell is going on, man? Let's go. Yeah, the killer grandma. This one is about the man who earned himself the title of the Grandma Killer. Stay away, Cynthia. By the way, what if you're new to this channel, Cynthia. I post both solved and unsolved cases here on a weekly basis. So, if that's your kind of thing, please consider subscribing to Coffee House Crime. Mm -hmm. So, who is the vulgar maniac? What was his recurrent motive? And how did he manage to claim the lives of 32 victims? How would I know? Pull up a seat, grab a coffee, and sit back. This is the case of the vulgar maniac. Mm. Volga Maniac, the case of Volga Maniac, okay. So that's his name, Volga... <laughs> no, he has a name, I know that, but that's his nickname, right? Crazy. Maybe Beautiful this isn't Russia. a country you'd have expected me to cover. Mm -mm. Or maybe it is. Not really. Today we're heading to Russia, and more specifically, mm. to the city of Kazan. Kazan! Kazan, located around 500 miles east of Moscow, is, is the capital way. city of the Republic of Tatarstan. A Republic of Russia. Dating back to the year 1438, Kazan is one of the oldest cities in Russia. Really? And although wow. it shows the signs of weathered architecture, it has kept its pace with modern day life. In fact, in the year 2019, it was hailed as the best city for good life in Russia. Really? With a well developed nice. infrastructure, convenient transport links, and a vibrant culture, Kazan has established itself as a modern-day contender for nice. any Russian looking for a happy way of living. The city is home to a population of roughly 1.4 million people, wow. and there seems to be something for pretty much everyone. Check that is crazy, man. Coming from a small city that only has 7,000, uh, you know, citizens right here where I live, 7,000 we are counting, but it's just amazing to think about 1.5 million people. That's a lot of people. Man, I wish there was more stores in the city and there were more people because there are more people, more businesses, more laziness. I like that, man. I like laziness. But yeah, that's kind of crazy, man. It's kind of crazy, the city that they so big. Like, oh, it's just a small city. Well, this is a small city. But of course, Russia has its villages too where there's not many people. So yeah, let's go. History. The Blue Lakes for some time in nature. Or the Riviera Aqua Park for some fun. Now, as far as Russian standards go, life here is pleasant. And when comparing it to other cities across the country, the crime rate is pretty low too. Maybe that's why, in the year 2011, city police were rather shocked to identify an alarming pattern unfolding right in front of them. I could imagine that. 
The date was the 5th of March, 2011. Mm. And wow, after receiving a phone call from a very distressed woman, police were dispatched to an apartment complex on Batyashin Street, north of the Volga River in Kazan. Okay. Once officers arrived, they walked into one of the ground floor apartments, and it was there that they found a rather disturbing scene. A 91-year-old woman was found dead on the floor. The victim's head was covered with a pillow, and she had been suffocated to her death. The victim, who was known in the local area as Nasimish Maratova, was a well-loved elderly woman. She was a pawnbroker and would often financially help her friends and her family when in need. Her family had made multiple attempts to call her several times throughout the early morning and the afternoon. Okay. But after her unusual silence, her daughter decided it was best to stop by that evening after work to check in on her. Shortly after, she would call the police. Her daughter, who was now a mother herself, highlighted that Nassim was normally very cautious about opening the door to strangers. Yet, there were no signs of forced entry into her apartment. Many old people in Denmark is the same way. They are really not, you know, comfortable with other people in their houses, not comfortable with random people. But these people will to sneak up on you, they will to steal, they will to do everything, because older women are very easy to extract. Uh, distract, sorry. And when you distract the older woman, you can get access to a phone, jewelry, everything. And you know, old ladies, they like to wear good jewelry. They like to wear different things. But this guy's just killing the grannies. I don't... Nah. No, don't kill grannies, man. They did their things for the, for the community. They did their things for the country. They deserve to live, man. They deserve to live, 100%. Everybody would deserve to live, but I just think it's kind of crazy going after grannies. But I think there's a lot of aspect of this guy. I think he has some problems with his parents or something. I don't know, granny, whatever. There's something that he's attracted to, that's why. Um, it's weird, very weird. Why can't you just leave all the women alive? What did, what did they do, right? They didn't do anything. But there's a lot of older people who don't let people into their houses. We don't do either, but it's more like we are more open for it. Where older people are more like, nah, <laughs> like shut the door in, right? So let's go. It's likely that she let her killer in on her free will, thinking he was a client to her loans. Investigations would conclude that she was killed sometime in the mid-afternoon. Mm. Money from her savings had disappeared from the property, mm. and she had a history of lending money out. Some of her clients actually owed her more than 160,000 rubles, wow. or four and a half thousand dollars at the time. So the motive unfortunately seemed to be financial gain. The situation was tragic for the family, mm. but no further clues could be identified. They were fairly certain that it was a one-off incident anyway, probably a junkie off the streets that owed Nassim money. That's fucked up. And so the case was closed. That's messed up, man. Six months would pass, and as the snowy days of Kazan turned towards spring and then into summer, no further details on Nassim's death would emerge. No other murders that seemed similar to this case would be observed either. But on the 24th of August 2011, the body of an 82-year-old woman, Udras Vaktanova, was found in her apartment located on Bustanya Street, really? only 1.5 miles north from Nassim's home and the details of this new case would be all too similar to those which were previously So made. they connected the police, right? Yeah. Investigators observed that the woman had been beaten before being suffocated. And according to the relatives of the murdered woman, 50,000 rubles had disappeared from her apartment too. Exactly one month later, a third similar death was uncovered. The body belonged to a 85-year-old woman. Man. Furniture and items... I don't understand how you can sink that low. I don't get it. And it seemed as if someone had been looking for something. And then two days later, a fourth victim. It was in the early afternoon on the 26th of October that an unknown man posing as a housing and communal services worker entered the apartment of an 83-year-old woman on Novtorov Street. Her name was Nadezda Fotantova. She let him into her apartment and, after hitting her several times in the face, began to strangle her. She blacked out, but with great luck, she wasn't killed. Thank God for that. Nadezda eventually came around, and after waking up, she realized that she had been robbed. 30,000 rubles, or $800, had been stolen from her home. Fearing for her life, naturally, she immediately called the police to report the crime. 
and after being medically treated, she gave a description of the man. He looked to be in his late twenties, was around five foot seven, and had a Slavic appearance. He was also wearing a dark jacket and had a black knitted hat. It was only after this fourth attack that investigators finally combined all these cases together mm. into one proceeding. Up until this point, it seemed as if they were, well, hesitant to consider that they had a serial killer within Of course, board. because Russia does not like they now it. had a surviving victim, and finally, a description of the man. Rumours began to circulate at this stage. Local residents in the surrounding districts, and then folk from further afar, would learn of this man in the city of Kazan who would try to make his way into the homes of elderly women and kill them for their money. Following the description given to police, and the sketch that came out after it, the community could now generate an idea of what the man looked like. And the failure in killing his fourth victim seemed to scare him too, as his activity would become dormant. But just like clockwork, three months later on the 6th of February, another body yeah, was found yeah. in Govedskia, south of the river Volga. She was also an elderly woman of 82 years and she was found lying dead in her own hallway. She had been strangled with a robe sash, which was then tightened with a tablespoon. Her home had been looted, and golden jewellery, along with the house key, were missing. I think it's just a rabble the who's, following month, I don't know, a sixth victim. Money. She know. was strangled with the cord from an iron. Shortly after her, God a seven, damn. and then an eighth murder would follow. But the story of his ninth victim was different to the rest. After her death, the killer was searching her apartment for money and valuable items. And just in that moment, the dead woman's son arrived home. As he entered the front door, he could hear someone or something rummaging in the next room. He called out, but the killer was quick to get away, jumping out from the window of his victim's third story apartment and disappearing into the night. My God, damn. In what was once merely a concerning pattern of two or three deaths, the situation had now manifested itself into an almost certain reality that the city of Kazan had a serial killer at large. Alright man, so I just want to say this guy's breaking into homes. He's basically stealing all the values, all the money, everything because he need that, he needs to give him rich quick. He need a fix, he needs some drugs, he need whatever he need, right? But why wouldn't he just steal them instead of killing these old ladies? I know it's not better. Well, yeah, it is. They keep their lives, right? But this guy deserves the hell. This guy deserves the worst that can happen to him. Like, seriously. It is horrible to listen to these things that you would do this to all the people, or any people for that matter. Like, I don't agree with that. I think it's the most disgusting shit I've ever seen in my entire freaking life, man. I hope you die. I really hope you, you suffer something or, you know, I can't say that as a Buddhist, you die. But in this case, if you hurt all the women, Definitely, 100%, because they gave their shit to society. They went 91 years living their lives, doing their things, and you, man, you killed them. Jesus, this horrible shit, man. I don't like watching this. Why, why did I watch this? <laughs> Let's go. And with those murders spreading from north of the river now to the south, it was no longer fair to assume that any part of the city was mm. safe. As possible sightings of the suspect started to increase, Speculation between neighborhoods began to spread like wildfire. Really? And by spring of 2012, Russia had nicknamed this most recent serial killer as the Volga Maniac. And as his notoriety grew, so did the area in which he would commit his crimes. He began to target elderly women in the city of Ulyanovsk, 140 miles south of Kazan. And next was the western city of Nizhny Novgorod, the eastern city of Ozhevsk, the northeastern city and of God Kalim, damn. and finally the southern city of Samara. Brother. And by August the 1st of 2012, just 10 Get months into his reign of terror, the Volga maniac had claimed the lives of 17 victims, with an 18th emotionally scarred for life. The Volga mm. maniac really was starting to become a problem for police. At his current rate, he was killing more than one person per month. And yet, investigators were still none the wiser to who this man could be. They knew his motive, and they had a sketch too. But after so many victims, leads, sightings, and clues, they were still none the wiser. It was theorised that perhaps the killer was working in a job that had access to some form of database or list of elderly people. 
He seemed too successful for these attacks to be random. Yeah, exactly. Being an yeah. older resident of Kazan and the surrounding area at the time, it must have been terrifying. I think he worked at the, I don't know, community center, whatever it is, for the older, the elderly site, whatever it is. And I think he's reading the list, he's looking at these people, he's visiting these people, he's doing his thing, right? And he's just reading out the layout of what is going on, is she alone? Because it's kind of random for choosing these ladies and they are alone, right? There is probably a lot of alone ladies, I understand, but again, as he said, it's kind of not random. It is very, very specific what he's going after. And that, that that's something that you could, you know, watch in serial killers. Like they have a specific thing, even it is strangling hookers, picking up the hookers from one street or, you know, an area, or, you know, something like that, man. It's just, you know, they have these crazy things up in their brain that makes sense for them. I don't understand it, but they do. So let's go. I mean, put yourself in the shoes of an elderly mm. woman. You're in your golden yeah. years, a little bit weaker than you used to be, and less prepared to take on an intruder. Exactly. And this serial killer was still very much mm. at large. And for those who didn't have to worry for their own lives, they worried for their elders yeah. instead. It was a scary time. Hundreds of thousands of people were locking their doors and their windows at night. It was in September of that same year that the Volga maniac decided to target victims in Bashkiria located over 300 miles east from his hotspot, Kazan. The radius in which he was operating was getting larger, and by now a new pattern to his crimes had emerged. It seemed as if he was almost treating his new locations like excursions. Short trips to a new city, where he would claim multiple lives in just a couple days, before heading back to Kazan and settling down. And unfortunately for the city of Bashkiria, this theory rang true. Between the 25th and the 27th of that month, he claimed the lives of three more elderly God women, damn. before disappearing once again. But on the 26th of September, <clears> while <throat> committing a second murder of the trip, bad luck would finally present itself in the form of a surveillance camera. And that's because, at long last, CCTV installed both in and outside the block of flats had finally given both a figure and a face to the dreaded vulgar main. Nice. It was at 3.21pm on the 26th of September that CCTV captured footage of a man walking into an apartment complex in downtown Bashkiria. And conveniently, the man seemed to enter just as an older woman was entering. She stopped for a moment to wash her shoes in a puddle, mm -hmm. before heading on inside in the same direction as the man. Why would you hurt? And just one minute later, a camera inside captured this figure waiting at the top of a staircase. After apparently spotting the woman, he helped her walk up the stairs. He then follows her through her front door into her apartment. My God Two damn, cameras bro! Capturing the door closing behind them. That woman was unfortunately his thirty-first victim. My God damn! She would be found dead in her apartment just two days later. A witness, who happened to be in the area at the same time as the Volga maniac, claimed that they had seen him near the block of apartments around half an hour prior to the surveillance footage. They gave a description of him which matched that taken from the camera. This description, which was eventually turned into an identikit sketch, and the surveillance footage from multiple angles, was a big win to police. The identity of the Volga maniac had finally been brought forward with more clarity. But this information would only be realised several days after the crime. And by then, God the serial damn. killer had found his 32nd victim, nah. before fleeing the city of Bashkiria. The surveillance footage, along with identikits, were released to the public soon after. And although the footage clearly displayed what the man visually looked like, a formal identification was never actually made. But the announcement did seem to have one other effect to this serial killer. Because after this footage had been shared to millions of citizens across Russia, the murders would suddenly stop. Of course. Weeks went by with no further casualties. Weeks which developed into months, and eventually into a year. Ever since his last attack in Bashkiria, the Volga maniac seemed to vanish without a trace. He died. But despite the killer's silence, law enforcement would not back down. And as the year 2013 drew to a close, a reward of 1 million rubles, or $13,000, was promised for anyone who had information that would contribute towards the identification of the Volga maniac. Nice. However, no rewards were issued, 
and the killer still remained totally anonymous. Oh, God damn. This guy, man. But not all was lost. Although investigators were slow off the mark to acquire surveillance footage of the man, they had in fact already pieced together several other clues from his various crime scenes. In one incident, the Volga maniac had accidentally left his scarf at the crime scene. That scarf containing sweat, and therefore his DNA. Yes. And in one other incident, he had accidentally dropped his lighter, also containing the same Yes. DNA. Not only would this generate a DNA yes! profile, but it also confirmed that both crime awesome. scenes, one in Kazan and one in Bashkiria, both had the same killer. He had also inadvertently left a shoe print in the snow, which would lead back to a specific kind of shoe and size that the killer wore. But along with the surveillance footage, that was just about all the information that they had. The leading theory was that he was now hiding somewhere on Sakhalin Island, located just north of Japan's Northern Island. But that was just a theory. Why would he hide there, though? Investigators had no idea. The Volga maniac could simply be hiding, but he could also be in prison on other charges, or in rehabilitation, or even dead. There was no way to know. They would just have to wait and see, and hope that one day he could be caught. Eight long years would pass since his final murders, and eight long years with almost nothing to show for it. Over 10,000 examinations had been conducted on over 10,000 suspects during that time, but each lead came back with no true correlation to the DNA. And for every examination, there were multiple I think some organized crime got him. Investigations I think they were knocked extensive out. over the years. They even thought they had obtained fresh footage of the killer in 2016, when surveillance footage showing this guy was leaked to the press. But after tracking this man down, the footage was confirmed to be a dud. The investigative committee later denying that this was the Volga maniac. They did, however, have a fresh theory, and they believed that whoever he was, he was likely a resident of Vidmurtia, a region located east of Kazan. They also suggested that he was likely to be a native of Tartistan, and in his younger years, studied at school in Kazan. Really? How the fuck did you come up with that It was in the late months of 2020 that a sudden twist to the story of the Volga maniac came to light. A twist so influential, yet so random, that not even the killer himself could have done anything to avoid this from happening. And the effect that it would have on his future was cataclysmic. Really? Wow. It was November of 2020. And Russia's Christmas, which happens to be on January the 7th and not December the 25th, was drawing closer. January the 7th is Christmas. Just like the rest of the world, mm. it's normal for everyone to start thinking of the family a little more than usual as the festive season approaches. And for an old woman in the small Kazan village of Dabishki, it was no different. The older woman began to think about her son. She missed him. Oh. He was alive, as far as she could tell. But the two had lost contact for several years at this stage. Wait. Through her loneliness, she decided to try and track him down. She called the police, who, in return, offered her to undergo a DNA match test. The woman accepted this offer. A few days later, her results came back, and, unknown to her, her DNA had striking coincidences to that of the DNA found at the crime scenes of the Volga maniac. What?! Investigators were made aware what? of this matchup, and in response, they checked their own databases to look for any former criminal who had the same surname as this woman, who was known as Mrs. Tagarov. A comparison of the DNA found at the crime scene was now specifically ran against the DNA of every male Tagarov they had. Lo and behold, the analysis came yes. back with a direct match. Nice. Private investigators decided to play dumb to the old woman and hand the details of her son back to her, and wait and see what came to light. It was only several days later that a 38-year-old man by the name of Radik Tagarov made his way back to Dabishki, where he restored ties with his family, reconnected with friends, and eventually came face to face with police. And he wasn't too pleased with the whole situation. 
От 25 до 32 – это предварительные данные. Тагирова задержали в ходе крупной совместной операции ФСБ, СКР и МВД. Стоит отметить, что долгие поиски сотрудники всех этих ведомств тоже вели сообщение. Лучшие you. специалисты объединились в следственно-оперативную бригаду. Оперативники ФСБ, криминалисты, God, СКР, сотрудники полиции pain. Татарстана и главного управления уголовного розыска МВД России. But who exactly was Radik Tagarov? You fucking idiot. Radik was a resident of Kazan. He was a 38-year-old man, and he always lived relatively local to the area, within the borders of Tatarstan. Damn. As a child, Radik was described as an ordinary kid from a good family. He kept out of trouble, was relatively well-educated, and didn't experience any real trauma as he grew up. Mm. In his How do you know that, years, though? He worked as a mechanic at a local garage, and he was known to be reliable. Mm. But this is where the troubling signs started to appear. In 2005, Radik was convicted for illegal arms trafficking, which left him with a three-year sentence behind bars. And in 2009, he was found guilty of theft, giving him another two years in prison. You're when finally fuck. released, Radik found it difficult to land a job. With his troubling past, he was unable to find employment, and quickly found himself living on the streets, without any food or money. Yeah, but why did you kill the during this time, It makes no found sense himself to me. trying out drugs. And shortly after, he became addicted to spice, ah, okay, okay, also okay, known okay, as synthetic okay. marijuana. Yeah, without Always a job drugs. and no form of ambition, the only thing he needed and longed for was cash to feed his ongoing addiction. And knowing that the older generations in Russia tend to trust digital banking less than any other demographic, he decided that they would be the perfect audience to target. And so he started to stalk older women, before following them back to their homes and robbing them. In what is likely his most darkest decision, Radek decided to kill his victims rather than just take their money, in an effort to avoid ever being caught. But after his final crimes in Bashkiria, the surveillance footage was enough to deter him from ever killing again. The surveillance footage almost had him caught, and so Radik therefore decided to give his spice fueled murder spree up. Get a job, man. God damn. That's messed up. He left his sins behind him, as best as he could at least, and started a new and honest life. Nah. And eventually, Radik found himself a job in the city of Kazan nah, as a locksmith. You don't deserve a job. By the year of 2018, he had even Listen, been married. Listen, I hate the excuse that, oh, he's poor. He has no money. That does not give you an excuse to take other people's life. That does not give you an excuse to take what other people they have just because you're poor and a little sad fuck. It doesn't have, it doesn't mean that you have to take lives and you have to take other people's things, man. Be a little honor. Be a fucking man, man. Jesus Christ, man. Enough. Let's go. To a woman. Pissed. And by 2020, she gave birth to his first son. Police would eventually catch up to Radik and detain him in his own apartment shortly after matching his DNA to the crime scenes. And after being taken into custody, Radik Tagorov would crumble, of course, confessing his crimes behind tears. <laughs> Fuck you laughing for? I don't want to listen to this sad fuck. Anyway, I'm gonna quit the video here before I really get pissed. You know, people, they make decisions, right? I understand that. You know, there's a lot of sad things about people taking drugs and that. I totally understand that 100%. But at the end of the day, you have a life and you have 
you know, opportunity. Whatever you want to do, there's a consequence for every single move that you make, no matter what. But everybody, they cry about the move they make because the consequences come after them, right? Then they cry about it on TV, they cry about it on YouTube, they cry about it everywhere, right? Consequence is always about to follow the next move that you are making. This guy made a move. Consequences are following you. You a dead man. But again, drugs is fucked up. And this is why I'm so much against it when people, they say they need to legalize drugs. Legalize marijuana. I totally understand that. But legalizing drugs, no. Drugs put too many families in the gutter. It made too many kids homeless. It made too many kids motherless, fatherless, everything like that. Drugs and alcohol is one of the big factors. Now, do I love to drink alcohol? I love it a bit. I love to get a beer, love to get some Hennessy, cognac, whiskey, but I don't drink that much. But again, people have to control what they're doing. We can't just ban everything that is bad because then we can keep going banning things. People, they have to start taking responsibility for the choices that they make and the consequences that is going to come with the choices they make. I'm so sick of hearing all these excuses about every single fucking thing in the book, right? But uh, yeah, it is what it is, guys and girls. Anyway, I'm not going to mamble anymore. I know you're tired. I know you probably want to go to sleep because I know I want to go to sleep. But yeah. <laughs> anyway, guys and girls, I love you so much. Thank you for watching this. Please hit the like button down below. Please do subscribe. Hit the notification button to get updated on the newest videos that come to this channel. And please, please, please subscribe. We're trying to get to 20,000 subscribers. So be massively appreciated if you wanted to support, of course. Anyway, guys and girls, comment down below what you think about this little sick fuck. I really want to know. He's a disgusting little human creature. There's excuses for many things, but there is no excuse for this one. You can't just run around murdering people. I have no respect for that. I have no tolerance for that. I don't understand how you can see your life above others. I don't understand that. Just because you're broke and they have some money, that's none of your fucking business. That's why. Anyway, guys and girls, love you so much, and I'm going to see you until the next one. Peace.